Section One of Flower Patch Among the Hills. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Flower Patch Among the Hills by Flora Clickman. In memoriam, just to explain who everybody is, why the cottage is, why the book is. In memoriam dedicated to my husband there twice a day the seven fills the salt sea-water passes by and hushes half the babbling why and makes a silence in the hills part one just to explain who everybody is virginia and her sister ursula are my most intimate friends virginia really quite a harmless girl imagines she has a scientific bias ursula domesticated to the backbone led a strenuous life in the pursuit of experimental psychology till she switched off to wash hospital saucepans it will be so obvious that i scarcely need add what little common sense the trio possesses is centred in me abigail is my housemaid her title to fame is the fact that she is the only servant i have ever been able to induce to remain more than a fortnight at one stretch in the country the others including those who are orphans always have a parent who suddenly breaks its leg after they have been about ten days away and wires for them to come home at once the cook has discovered a number of cousins in the naval division at the crystal palace detachments of which pass my london house hourly while many units partake of my cake and lemonade and of course you can't neglect your relatives in war time you never know whether that'll be the last time you see them she says waving a tearful tea-towel at all and sundry who march past naturally she doesn't care to be away from town for many days at a time the parlour-maid was interested in a member of the l c c fire brigade when he enlisted and incidentally married someone else unfortunately the very week she was away with me this has given her a marked distaste for the simple pleasures of rural life abigail is unengaged what i ask is what better off are you if you are she inquires of space take my sister now with eight children and but as i am not taking any one with eight children just now the sister's biography is neither here nor there abigail is a willing kind-hearted girl also she has a mania for trying to arrange every single household ornament in pairs she would be invaluable to any one outfitting a noah's ark as for the other people who walk through these pages they do not appertain exclusively to one district i have had two cottages one beyond godalming in surrey the other high among the hills that border the river wye some of the country folk live in the one village some in the other but the scenery the little wild things and the garden are all related to the cottage that overlooks tinton abbey part two why the cottages i took a cottage in the country on a day when i had got the fag end of the very last straw and felt i could not endure for another minute the screech of the trains the honking of motors the clanging of bells the clatter of milk carts and the grind and squeal of electric cars the ever ringing telephone the rattle and roar of the general traffic the all-pervading odour of petrol and the many other horrors that make both day and night hideous in our great city and reduce the workers to nervous wreckage the cottage has been so arranged that not one solitary thing within its walls shall bear any relation to the city left far behind and nothing is allowed to remind the occupants of the business rush the social scramble and the electric light type of existence that have become integral parts of modern life in towns here to keep my idle hands from mischief i made me a flower patch part three why this book is i was viciously prodding up bindweed out of the cottage garden with the steel kitchen poker when the telegraph boy opened the gate unhinging my back and inducing it into the upright with painful care i read a message from my office to the effect that there was some hitch in regard to the american copyright of a certain article 
I had passed for press before leaving. This would necessitate it being thrown out of the magazine that month. Would I wire back what should go in its place, as the machines were at a standstill? Under ordinary circumstances, I should merely have waved a hand, and instantly a suitable substitute would have been on the machines with scarcely a perceptible pause. That is, if I had been in London. But such is the witchery of the flower-patch, that no sooner do I get inside the gate than I forget every mortal thing connected with my office. And try how I would, I couldn't recall what possible articles I had already in hand that would make exactly six pages and a quarter, the length of the one held over. And because I could think of nothing else on the spur of the moment, I threw down the poker. It was red rust, alas, when I chanced upon it a week later and went indoors and wrote about the cottage and the hills when it was published in the magazine readers very kindly wrote by the bagful begging for a continuation it has been continuing with perennial requests for more for some time now this only shows how generously tolerant of editors are the readers of periodical literature virginia merely sniffs what won't people buy I don't think she need have put it so boldly as that. If by some miraculous chance there should be any profits from the sale of this book, I intend to devote them to the purchase of a cow, or hen, if it doesn't run to a cow, to aid the national larder. I shall call it the Memorial Cow, in memory of those who have been good enough to assist in its purchase. Should any reader wish to have the cow or hens, named specially after him or her self this could doubtless be arranged particulars on application to the publisher end of section one section two of flower patch among the hills this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen flower patch among the hills by flora glickman about getting there part two we always consider that emancipation takes place at one exact spot on the great western railway the only difficulty is that virginia and i never agree as to which is the exact spot virginia insists that the air suddenly changes just beyond chepstow station where we change from the london and south wales main line to the local train that two or three times a day weekdays only runs through our particular valley like a small boy's toy affair this train which makes up in black smoke for what it lacks of other dignity steams out of the main line junction with an important snort and rumble over the bridge it goes and the stranger would imagine it was well under way but no it then comes to a standstill at the point where the main line and the valley line meet in order that the gentleman who lives we presume in the signal box but who is always standing on the railway line when we see him may hand to our engine driver a metal staff some sort of a key they tell me which is said to unlock the single railway line i don't pretend to understand the process myself i only know that our engine driver looks lovingly at it as though it were the apple of his eye i've craned my head out of the window that's how i know and clasps it to his chest until it gets to the first station on the valley line where he hands it over to the station master who in turn gives him another one to which he clings just as pathetically in this leisurely way we proceed up the valley it wouldn't have any deep significance but for the fact that virginia maintains it is the first key that unlocks the imprisoned ego within her and sets her soul free from the trammels and shackles and cobwebs and chains hampering warping and enmeshing her that have been riveted by the blighting tendencies of london and a lot more to the same effect she says she feels the fetters burst directly that key is handed over for she knows then that the train is beyond the possibility of making a mistake and getting back on to the london main line again instead of the single pair of valley rails then it is that the air becomes fresher than ever 
the primroses that grow all up the rocks just beyond the signal box are very much finer than those on the junction side the sweet betsy alias red valerian starts to drape the ledges with rosy crimson as soon as the signal man walks back up the wooden steps to his cabin and virginia herself becomes a different being though opinions are painfully divided as to whether the change is for the better or for the worse she says she feels just like the lord mayor or the speaker in the house of commons with a myrmidon going on ahead of her bearing the mace we just let her talk on when she gets light-headed like this after all this rod of office which the engine driver cherishes is what virginia waits for through four hours of express train six if you go by a slow one and the spot where he receives it on the line is where she develops a beatific smile of wondrous amiability for me the chains snap a little further on after the driver has received his key of office the train meanders peacefully through west country orchards placid meadows and tawny gold cornfields past grey-brown haystacks past little cottages each with its pigsty and scratting hens and a clothesline displaying pinafores and sundry other garments only mentioned sato voice in the paper pattern section of ladies papers small hatless yellow-haired children gathering daisies or cowslips in adjoining fields wave at us as we go by then the engine braces itself for a mighty effort and gives a business-like shriek on its whistle this is the great exploit of the whole journey as it plunges into a very long dark clattering tunnel cut through solid rock here we sit in the breathless darkness for several minutes to emerge finally upon scenery so unlike that we left behind at the entrance to the tunnel as to suggest that we had entered another country gone are the cornfields the gentle undulations gone the farms and cottages the hayricks and barns almost in sheer precipices the rocks rise up from the rushing winding river in the valley below clothed from summit to base with forest trees the train now an insignificant atom on the face of nature puffs vigorously along a ledge cut halfway up the face of these giant hills from the windows on one side of the train you look down upon a world of rocks trees and water to the horseshoe bend where the river turns and twists and doubles back on itself again not a house is in sight the windows on the other side show more gray rocks rising up out of sight with trees growing where you would scarcely think they could find root hold much less food to live and thrive on and where it is bare stone and there are no trees the scarred and jagged surface of the rocks due to far away earth rends and more modern rock slides is lovingly swathed and festooned with trails of travellers joy and ivy and byrony while ferns and foxgloves wild strawberries and mother of millions flourish on the narrow ledges and sprout out from sheltered crannies such a mist of delicate loveliness veiling all that is grim and cold and hard even the wooden posts from which wire is stretched to fence off the railway company's land from the adjoining woods are entirely covered with a living mosaic of small leaved ivy patterned with no two scrolls alike in a way that human hand could never copy below there is always the river that swirls and rushes noisily at low tide over its weirs a heron stands motionless on a grey-green moss-covered boulder near the bank he looks up at the little train but it is too far away to worry him he and a kite circling high overhead are the only signs of life to be seen as one passes along yet the whole earth is teeming with small folk furred and feathered the rarest of butterflies are glinting over the rocks the otter is hiding down in the river pools and from time to time a salmon leaps into the air a flash a streak of silver and a series of eddying ripples that is all this is the spot where for me a new life begins where unconsciously i draw my breath with a deep intake and suddenly feel the past slipping from me the noise and din the sordidness and care of the city fade into the background and become nothing more substantial than some remote nightmare 
here in this valley of peace and quietness my dreams become realities and best of all here god seems to lay his hand on tired heart and tired brain and i find myself saying this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest and this is the refreshing we had just witnessed the presentation of the first key as usual virginia and i had been arguing no that isn't the right word i never argue i merely discuss things intelligently at any rate we had been exchanging views that differed as to the exact place where we noticed the great change come over ourselves in particular and things in general as we didn't get any nearer a final settlement we appealed to ursula who was sitting silent with a faraway look in her eyes as of one engaged in bridging space and measuring the stars she came back to earth however at our question and said she was absolutely sure the moment of her great transformation was when she got hold of a cup of proper domestic tea as distinct from the indigested railway variety indeed for the past few minutes she had been entirely absorbed in the mental contemplation of the meal she hoped abigail would soon be preparing even then she could smell the sizzling ham and the frying eggs and the buttered toast we should have on arrival we were in the sulphurous depths of the tunnel at the moment naturally i was hurt as i said to her i knew my board was frugal and my viands simple modest unaffected and unassuming but at least they didn't smell like that fortunately she hadn't much time to explain what she did and what she didn't mean for we came out of the tunnel into the panorama of hills and silence no one ever talks much just here save the braying type of tourist besides there is the abbey to watch for no matter how many times you may see that you always wait expectantly for the moment when you catch the first glimpse of the wonderful gray ruin the abbey makers of the olden days not only knew how to build but they also knew how to place their beautiful structures and the setting of our abbey is as nearly perfect as anything can be in this world the steep hills recede a little bit just at one bend of the river leaving room for a broad green meadow between the water and the uprising steeps here the abbey was placed a babbling river in the foreground dark larch covered hills in the background surely it is no fanciful exaggeration to think that the beauty all around them must have influenced the men who raised that wonderful poem in stone i would like to take you into the abbey and show you the beautiful views that can be seen from every ruined window each one a framed picture in itself the spray of oak leaves carved on one piece of stone the live snapdragons growing out of buttresses the graceful spring of each slender arch the perfect proportions of the whole building for despite the cruel wreckage it suffered in the past it is still the most lovely gothic ruin in england but to-day we can't stay the train hurries on through another short tunnel over a bridge spanning the river and a talkative weir and then into our station in the summer there is a good deal of bustle in this station which is the haunt of many tourists i am told that five out of every ten visitors are from the united states no american thinks of doing england without seeing our valley which is famous for its scenery and its ruins thus you always find a number of women in trim short waists and wearing large chiffon veils on the top of their hats at angles quite unknown to the english woman sitting on the platform about train time writing the usual budget of picture postcards but we aren't foreigners as the natives styles every one who doesn't belong to their village that is one of the many charms of arriving at this station here no one regards us merely as passengers who can't find their luggage or passengers who have changed where they had no business to or passengers who expect the local porter to know by heart all the railway connections and times of return trains throughout the british isles neither are we among the people who look suspiciously at every wagonette driver certain that he is going to overcharge and uncertain as to which is likely to overcharge the least we have no anxieties concerning the truth of the advertised merits of the various hotels and apartments to let in the village we belong there is a sense of homecoming in our arrival 
the porters actually rush forward to help with our luggage and the station-master raises his cap old bob who occupies the doubly proud position of being the only one among the fly proprietors who displays a pair of steeds attached to his vehicle while he is also the only one who usually drives what he describes as the elite is waiting with his wagonette and a pair don't forget and a cart for the luggage it really is comforting to be claimed by someone at the end of a journey if it be but the wagonette driver i feel so solitary such an orphan when i chance to arrive alone at some strange place in quest of a holiday possibly unknown to a single person but the landlady to be don't you know the sinking feeling that comes over you as you look around upon the crowds of people some scrambling in and some scrambling out of the train every face a blank so far as you are concerned no one to trouble whether you ever get any further or whether you remain in that jostling turmoil for ever you almost wish you could get into the train and go back to town again you reflect that there at least the butcher knows you and the people next door and the crossing sweeper at the corner you revive after having some tea but it is possible to spend a very doleful homesick quarter of an hour between the time you get out of the train and the time you sit down to a meal in some strange room whose painful unlikeness to the ones you live in accentuates your loneliness but that never happens to us in our valley before we have got out of our compartment abigail is already on the platform and holding a levy consisting of two porters the signal man the assistant engine driver from a goods train in the siding and old bob's nephew who drives the cart all lend a hand as she proceeds to marshal the luggage and with a peremptory wave of her umbrella directs its disposal of course there really isn't much luggage that is one of the advantages of retreating to your own secluded cottage being off the beaten track as we are there is no necessity to take many toilets either demi or semi or a large variety of lounge robes or matinees or boudoir negligees or rest frocks or tea gowns or cocoa coats or evening wraps built of chiffon and really necessary handy things of that sort all we take with us is just a few clothes to wear on one occasion virginia did bring down a long article i don't know what else to call it composed of about ten yards of white net embroidered here and there with large beads an artificial rose sewn on to one corner of the curtain-like thing a gilt metal fringe suggestive of shoelace tags all around the edges she couldn't quite understand how she came by it she said she remembered an energetic ultra elegant shop assistant somewhere displaying it before her with the information that it was a slumber swirl and assuring her condescendingly that it was the very latest and absolutely sweet and just the thing for outdoors in the summer virginia said she agreed with her she was sure knowing her own sweet and plastic disposition she would certainly have agreed with her she was thankful to say she wasn't one of those people who perpetually disagree with other people but she had no recollection of having attached her name and address to the wisp much less of having paid for it still the energetic damsel had sent it home and here it was ursula after one glance at the confection hastily turned her eyes away and announced that for her part she didn't consider it well quite adequate her sister explained that it wasn't supposed to be worn that way and she arranged herself with closed eyes on the sofa to show us how it would look when draped over her head and all as she rested in the hammock it took a lot of adjusting so as to avoid getting some knobbly bead motif just under her ear and to prevent the shoelace tags attacking the underside of the face and when she had at last found a spot of unembellished net on which to lay her rose-leaf cheek she was afraid to move for fear of splitting the frail net ursula merely snorted when next i saw the slumber swirl part of it had been converted into a meat safe of irreproachable moral character ursula having utilized the frame of our getting worn out one for the purpose no our luggage is only trifling and only consists of just what we need 
abigail takes mine and her own to paddington in a bus which also picks up the luggage of the other two girls en route individually the details do not seem much but i confess when i see it dumped all together on the platform the aggregate looks somewhat nondescript there will be four large hat boxes or five if abigail brings more than one anything from three to seven trunks abigail's collapsible straw basket a bundle of umbrellas and sunshades the dog in his travelling basket a chip basket containing pots of mysterious seedlings virginia has been specially raising in town which usually get upset once or twice on the way and have been known to turn out docks there is sure to be a cardboard box for one of abigail's best jap silk sunday frocks that she doesn't want to get crushed a string bag containing abigail's novels and snippety weeklies her crochet a few oranges two bananas some chocolate and whatever other refreshment she will need on the journey a brown paper parcel holding a few articles of wearing apparel also belonging to abigail that she only remembered at the last minute and cook did up for her then ursula is sure to bring some contribution to the larder perhaps tomatoes and a cake naturally there is our lunch basket and i personally never feel complete unless i have my leather dispatch box beside me i also take a suitcase containing my mackintosh in case it rains when i arrive books and papers which i never read knitting and similar necessities for the journey it is also useful as a final receptacle for oddments i omitted to pack elsewhere virginia and ursula bring similar suitcases for similar reasons sometimes abigail springs surprises on us at the last minute whatever have you there i asked one day as she joined us on the paddington platform a jangling parcel in one hand that sounded like a badly cracked bell and a large protrusion silent fortunately embraced in the other arm oh this is just a new zinc pail shaking the musical packet we need an extra one and i put in a little iron shovel as i want one for my kitchen skittle and there's a nutmeg grater too the one down there is getting rusty and this nodding towards her chest is an enamel washing up bowl our big one down there leaks and she proceeded serenely on her way to the accompaniment of iron shovel clink clanking against a zinc pail with the nutmeg grater tin tin nabulating cheerfully in a higher key and evidently pleased at the public interest she was arousing not that her surprises are always so useful on one occasion i noticed she had brought two collapsible straw baskets but concluded she had some very special new frocks for the flower show the porter disposed of the luggage while abigail was looking the bookstall over when she returned and found both baskets missing she rushed to the guard's van soon things were being dragged out again abigail excitedly urging haste the guard helped abigail assisting with much conversation eventually she lugged one basket up to her own compartment scorning the help of the penitent porter as she passed my compartment a heart-rending meow came from the basket what in the world i began it's only angelina abigail explained she hasn't seemed well lately i thought a change of air might do her good only it gave me a bit of a fright when i found they'd put her in the van thinking she was luggage incidentally angelina is my cat being my own place and not someone else's we are going to it occasionally happens that there are items of furnishing that need to go down a mirror for instance that is too large to pack in a trunk strictly speaking the railway company might be within their rights if they argued that such things could not legitimately be called passengers luggage but virginia said with regard to the mirror four feet by two that if they objected to take it she should tell them every woman is entitled to carry a mirror among her personal luggage fortunately no one so far has objected to any of the details of our impedimenta so long as the excess charges are promptly paid we usually go down with the same guard i tell him what the contraband is he carries the parcel off majestically assuring me that his one eye won't leave it all the way down no matter where the other may be focused and he begs me to have no anxiety as to its safety i haven't 
i know from long experience that the guards and officials on the g w r have elevated politeness and courtesy from a mere duty to a fine art sometimes i almost wish they wouldn't take quite such care of our things there was the brown pitcher for instance i had been wanting a very large one for fetching the water from the spring outside the cottage gate of course i know you can get big enamel jugs painted duck egg blue or anything else in the art line that you fancy but the latter seems so strident so townified so newly rich so overdressed when you see them beside our moss-grown wooden spout where the mountain spring splashes down into a stony hollow among ferns and long mosses the sturdy but humble brown pitcher tones in better with the pale yellow sand in the bottom of the hollow the browns and greys and greens of the stones and growing things all round the very water falls into it with a mellow musical sound instead of the hollow tinny ring that the enamelled creature gives forth but i couldn't see one in the village shop as big as i required ursula however ran against the very thing unexpectedly in town the only difficulty was the packing so she decided to carry it just as it was virginia expressed a sincere hope that she would at least tie a pale blue bow on the handle she got it safely as far as paddington but here an iron pillar suddenly ran alongside and torpedoed the pitcher so she said knocking a small but very business-like hole clean through its bulging side then the question arose what was she to do with the remnants the train was due to start in two minutes so she hadn't time to inquire for the station dustbin virginia suggested that she should try to induce the bookstall boy to accept it as payment for a packet of milk chocolate failing that she had better put an advertisement in the paper offering a wonderful specimen of antique roman pottery in exchange for a sable motoring coat or a cartload of white mice what she did do was to leave it tidily on the nearest seat with the intention of bestowing sixpence on the first porter she could waylay if he would make himself responsible for its after career but apparently every employee at paddington station had enlisted the whistle was blown and the train started to move slowly just as the vigilant eye of the guard fell upon the disabled crock his face lighted up he seized it rushed to the moving compartment containing ursula madam he gasped you have forgotten this and he thrust it into her arms she didn't dare try to leave it behind any more end of section two section three of flower patch among the hills this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen flower patch among the hills by flora glickman about getting there part two then there was the fish it was on an occasion when virginia was coming down by herself and thus lacked the restraining and more practical hand of ursula now as i have already hinted virginia is an intelligent girl she can tell you exactly how many million tons of certain chemicals could be excavated from the very bottom of vesuvius if only they could manage to put out the fire of course and how if these million tons were applied to the land in mars as artificial manure the wheat crop they would produce in one year if only you could raise their temperature a few hundred degrees and this could easily be done if you transfer by wireless the heat that isn't needed in vesuvius to mars or is it the moon where they do want it why then where was i oh yes the wheat crop they would harvest per annum would be sufficient to feed the whole of the inhabitants of this planet of ours and several others thrown in for i forgot how many dozen years yes she is a very bright girl just as well informed on any other subject you like to mention excepting fish there she draws a woeful blank she has no more notion how to tell fresh fish at sight than a baby still she is generous in her intentions 
and as no one ever thinks of journeying to the cottage without taking something in the eatable line it is only right to take a little present when you go to stay with friends isn't it virginia cast about as to what she could bring game has no attraction we have plenty of that fish on the contrary is a rarity although our river is full we seldom see fish at the cottage excepting a very overdue variety that a man peddles round occasionally so she decided on fish alas and hastened into the first fishmongers she saw and ordered a dozen pairs of soles she maintains that wasn't what she meant to ask for it was oysters she wanted to bestow on me and she went in with the definite intention of purchasing a dozen oysters at that moment however her mind was somewhat preoccupied with a scientific invention she was thinking out whereby no woman need ever again handle a broom or carpet sweeper or anything of that kind it was a simple device consisting of a vacuum between the layers of leather on the bottom of the shoe and some sort of a section arrangement whereby you drew up the dust from the carpet or wherever you walked just by stepping on it you would clear as you go and instead of a person trailing dirt up and down the stairs by walking straight in from the garden and up to the top attic they would really be giving the stair carpet what would be equal to a good brushing moreover not only would spring cleaning be banished for ever when her invention was perfected but your shoes would never more need mending the dust collected in the shoe being subject to so many cubic inches of pressure due to the person standing on top of the shoe would become so compressed and self-adhesive as to offer a direct resistance to the friction set up between boot and alien matter trodden upon equal to the inverse ratio of i haven't the faintest notion what but i dare say you can follow her line of argument she herself says she is always lucid and concise at any rate i remember she said that it was terribly hard to be the mother of a huge family of boys who not only trailed dust and dirt into the house at all times and seasons but also wore out innumerable pairs of boots into the bargain whereupon i reminded her that neither of us need worry personally about that just yet she agreed but said that she did not alter her desire to benefit her day and generation and to rid the world of the burden of the broom and she was meditating on this and thinking of all the leather we had wasted by letting it wear off the bottoms of our boots when she saw the fish shop and though she thought a dozen oysters what she said was a dozen pairs of soles and of course i would recognize that the mistake wasn't her fault it was entirely due to the psychological action of the subconscious something that connected souls with boots and so forth anyhow the result was that she paid cheerfully for such a collection of fish as i hope i may never see again and how happy that fishmonger must have been when the transaction was completed only those who got a whiff of the fish can estimate virginia admitted that she thought the price seemed a lot for a dozen oysters soles were two shillings a pound at the time and the bag seemed heavy also she confessed that it was a trifle more than she had intended to spend on a present for me at that moment though she being a real lady would have been the last to mention it if i hadn't no she hadn't thought to look at what he put in she merely told him to pack them up very securely as she was going on a long railway journey she didn't know they were souls till she glanced at the bill in the train she consoled me with the information that fish has the most wonderful phosphorescent properties invaluable in the case of brain fag and she should see that i ate it all after a few miles of the journey the souls grew a little noisy in the rack you don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth truth to tell i didn't want to look at that particular gift at all but i had to open both windows at our first stop reading when the guard came to the door and politely inquired are you ladies all right can i get you anything 
i asked him if he would be so good as to take charge of the big rush bag i suggested that he could tie it on to the back buffer at the very end of the train i assured him it was nothing that would hurt but he only smiled and said he had plenty of room in his own compartment the basket would be quite safe there no one would touch it i could quite believe it when he came down the platform at swindon he looked very pale and out of sorts i thought conscious stricken i pressed a shilling into his hand and begged him to get himself a good cup of tea he said he would and certainly seemed to have revived when next he passed we got it home eventually without abigail detecting it i wanted to save virginia's face before the handmaiden as we took the basket wrapped up in my mackintosh in the wagonette with us abigail following behind in the luggage cart she did say later however that she wished that peddler and his awful kippers and bloaters could be suppressed by law he had evidently just been round she said and she could smell his wretched fish all the way as she drove up we didn't tell her what we had hidden in the old barn we buried them darkly at dead of night the only soft spot we could find that admitted of a good-sized trench being dug without much trouble was the moist earth beside the brook in the lower orchard next morning at breakfast time when the small dog ran in to greet us his nose and paws showed signs of active service as he joyfully dabbed brown mud on the front of our fresh print frocks and waggled his tail with the air of a dog who is conscious of heroic achievements abigail followed him with the bacon dish which in her excitement she tried to balance on the top of the coffee-pot you'd never believe what a high tide there has been in the brook she began a spring tide i should think it washed up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of large fish on to the bank never saw such a thing in my life before first i knew of it was slipping on one on the kitchen hearth-rug dandy had brought one in wanted me to grill it for his breakfast i suppose then i found he'd carried one up to the mat outside your bedroom door and just dropped a few others here and there about the house so i went out to see where he got em from judging by the smell they must have lain there for weeks wish i'd been here with a net at the time i've never caught a live fish in my life though i've often tried to fish in the pond on peckham rye naturally we expressed great interest and suggested immediate cremation in the kitchener later on the handyman was decidedly sceptical his grandfather had once caught a trout in that brook only he gave long biographical geographical and historical details which prove that it wasn't that brook at all but he hadn't a seed in he himself a coming down abigail scornfully pointed out that high tides came up and that these fish had been washed up from the river which is seven hundred feet below and she flapped one as evidence before his astonished eyes seeing is believing in our village to this day abigail's tales to cook and company and her friends at home of how she goes out and catches souls as large as place in our own brook and boils them for supper equal any fish stories ever told but to return to the luggage and ourselves which i left waiting at our little station while the luggage is being stowed into the vehicles we take stock of the platform that seems to fancy itself the pivot of the universe everybody that is going away scrambles into the train with precipitate haste as though they were trying to catch a train on the tube or a sprinting motor bus in the strand although they know quite well that the peaceful old engine already twenty-five minutes behind time won't think of stirring again until it has had a ten minutes nap those who have just arrived seem equally in a hurry to get somewhere else and they try to squeeze three thick out of the small station gate only to plant themselves in the path just outside for a long gossip with the first person they see there are women with empty baskets returning from market and women seeing off friends each carrying a huge bookie of flowers built up in the approved style from the back first a big background rhubarb leaf 
or something equally green and spacious then some striped variegated grass gardeners garters we call it also some southern wood better known as old man's beard tall flowers like foxgloves phlox japanese anemones early dahlias and sunflowers follow the shorter stems of pinks calceolarias sweet williams and roses are the next in succession finishing off with some gorgeous pansies and a very fat cabbage rose with a short stem that persists in tumbling out a piece of sweet briar and a few silver and gold everlasting flowers down low in the front if you have a geranium in your window etiquette demands that you add the best spray as a special offering to the bunch telling your friend all about the way you got that geranium cutting and the trouble you had to rear it you know the sort of complacent well-packed bunches that are the result of this combination not artistic of course according to town standards but all the same they are dears and i always feel i want every one i see the station itself is a flower garden and even in the space outside where the motor cars await the rich and the wagonettes and carts await the nearly poor primroses and violets and cowslips and bluebells grow thick on the banks naturally the arrival of the train is a matter of local importance and if you happen to be near the station about train time you go in and sit on the platform just to see who comes or goes and how well everybody looks and sturdy and brown after the pale anemic faces we have left in town you think how happy they must all be here in the fresh air and the sunshine so they ought to be and so most of them could be if only they kept a lookout for happiness and seized all that came their way but human nature the world over seems to love to contemplate the tragic or at least to pity itself the result is that every other person you meet in our village will tell you a tale of woe as highly colored as anything you hear in town how do you do i inquired last time i arrived of a comfortable healthy-looking woman who had just been seeing her daughter off by train her husband is a steady man in regular work she owns the cottage she lives in and a pig and has no difficulty in supplying the wants of her family which are few oh i'm not up to much im im she began things is so hard nowadays and no one gives we a bit o help there's that jane price she got a pound of tea and a hundred weight of coal and a red flannel petticut from the lady of the manor at christmas and she be a widder with ony her children but i ony got some tea and a petticut not a nice colour red neither no coal nor nothin and thur i've got he to keep as well as the children and in course i need it was in her due further along the platform i spoke to the wife of a small farmer a healthy soul with nothing much to worry her but she didn't intend to be behind hand with trouble other people found plenty to moan about she wasn't to be outdone you've heard of the awful time i'm having with my husband fell down in the wood and broke his leg in four places suffers terrible he does i expressed sympathy and asked her how long he had been in bed oh he isn't in bed can't spare the time to lay up with the haymaking just on he's cutting the five-acre field to-day he gets about but he has an abundation of pain at nights yes you're right very active he is there's no keeping him still he'll walk to his own funeral he will actually the man had a touch of rheumatism finally we are settled in the fly piled up with the lighter luggage while abigail and old bob's nephew follow in the cart to the stranger who has never been in our valley before the drive to the cottage is a thing of wonder to those of us who do the journey many times in the course of the year new beauties are always revealing themselves and the whole scene seems more lovely each time we look upon it if that be possible the station is on the river level down in the green depths of the valley but you cannot go many yards on level ground as the hills on either side of the river are steep with nothing but the narrowest footpath in places between their precipitous sides and the fast rushing water 
in many cases the cottage gardens on the hillside have to be kept up with walls of stone as one sees the vineyards built up on steep hillsides in vine-growing districts otherwise the rains and swollen brooks would wash the earth down in the winter into the river below the horses start the ascent as soon as they leave the station and pass through the small village which shows a curious medley in the way of architecture in the wall of an old cowhouse there is a gothic window built probably with stones taken from the ruined abbey all the windows of one cottage bear an ecclesiastical stamp before the beautiful ruin was carefully guarded as it is now people must have gone and helped themselves as they pleased to carved stonework and any fragment that they could make use of and thus you may find an exquisite bit of carved stone in a most ordinary three-roomed dwelling some of the cottages and barns may have been part of the abbey property at any rate one comes on architectural surprises in the most unexpected places but even though in this district man's handiwork has achieved wondrous things it is the work of nature that claims the attention the abbey seems a huge pile when you stand under its roofless walls but once you start to ascend the hills everything takes on new proportions no longer are you shut in by two high green hill walls the higher you go the smaller become the hills that are nearest to you as they reveal far greater giants behind them the blue welch mountains rise up still further beyond again below the river winds and loses itself seeming to come to an abrupt end against a barrier of dark green slopes but it evidently finds a way out for it is seen further on in the far distance a silver gleaming band still winding and still guarded by mountains that now are tinged with the purply blue tone that nature uses for her distant effects the lanes through which we pass are miracles of loveliness with their ferns and flowers and birds and butterflies but i think one's overwhelming thought is of the grandeur of the distances one is always looking away to the far off to the farms and small homesteads dotted at rare intervals on far heights and among the forests to the peaks beyond peaks to the light playing on miles of birch and oak to the shadowy coombs where hills drop down into other valleys i have always noticed when i am bringing any one for the first time from the station to my house that though i point out the roadside springs and waterfalls the glory of the hedges the rose-coloured honeysuckle that grows over one cottage smothering roof chimneys and all the visitors do not expend so much admiration on any of this it is always the inexplicable mystery of the hills that holds them every five minutes takes one higher and reveals a further panorama beautiful as are the lesser things lovely as is the old ruined abbey the human and the near seem to slip away from you as you look across the deep chasm where the river lies below to the vastness on the other side there is a power a force born of great heights and great spaces that cannot be explained but is surely felt by all who have not mortgaged their soul to mammon there was a depth of mystic meaning in the words of the shepherd poet even in the world's young days when he wrote i will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help it takes you about an hour to drive up to the cottage and by this time the lane has grown so narrow and so bumpy that you marvel the horses have ever got you there at all but when you have reached the little white gate you stand and look in silence a new touch is added to the landscape you are now high enough to look over the tops of some of the intervening hills and there away beyond between a dip in the hills you see a gleaming band of silver the waters of the channel some people consider no scenery perfect unless there is a railway in the foreground to take them back to town as soon as possible some artists always want a touch of scarlet to complete any picture myself i always think a glimpse of water is needed to make a beautiful view absolutely satisfying at my cottage i am doubly blessed i can see the river and the valley below 
and beyond there is the channel towards which that river is ever hurrying during the drive up the small white dog with brown ears sits on the box seat dividing his time between shrieking billingsgate insults to every local dog i blush for his manners and he looks so refined too and licking old bob's face not that he has any particular affection for our driver but he gets quite hysterical when he sees the countryside and scents the rabbits and old bob is the handiest recipient for his overwhelming gratitude a few dogs trail after us through the village telling him and one another what they will do when they get hold of him but they fall back when it comes to the hill and our own treasure looks triumphantly ahead for new dogs to revile deluding himself with the idea that he has slain all behind him and left their corpses in the road occasionally he ceases to be a bullying moor-dog and becomes almost human then he suddenly looks round at us wags his tail all he knows how and gives a little whimper that plainly says isn't it good to be here again and we all agree it is good to see the hills and the valleys the sturdy trees and the tender little ferns growing out of the walls best of all it is good to see the small white gate and the red tiled roof and the blue smoke curling up oh so peacefully from the cottage chimney it is good to see the flowers smothering the walls and the garden beds and very good to greet one's own furniture again one's own rooms one's own familiar things no matter how humble they may be for months we have clean forgotten that the living-room window requires two thumps if it is to be got open yet without a moment's hesitation ursula pulls off her gloves the moment we enter the door makes straight for the window and gives it the requisite couple of vigorous bangs so as to let in the evening scent of the honeysuckle that is thick about the porch for months it may be we have forgotten entirely that the lid of the biggest brown teapot has a knack of tumbling off into the teacup unless it is held on while one pours and yet the moment i take up that teapot again instinctively my hand grips the lid there is an indefinable spirit of welcome in all these little familiar things so commonplace and feeble and stupid they would seem to outsiders yet to us they imply that we belong it is part of the all-pervading rest that we find among these hills that we go on from just where we left off last time we don't have to start afresh or get acquainted with the place or learn anything new there is a great charm in returning to familiar scenes that is missed by those who are always rushing off on some new quest true they may find interest in another direction but i think with most of us excepting when we are very young and very inexperienced the homing instinct is strong i have laid my battered brain on pillows in some of the largest hotels in the world but i have never known in any of them the peaceful rest that is to be found in the cottage bedroom despite its sloping roof i am not saying that there is nothing whatever to disturb one there all too often mr and mrs starling several of them persist in building under the tiles just above my head and the various families demand breakfast at three thirty yet i even get to sleep through this there is one thing however that always wakes me and calls me in a most peremptory manner to get up and that is the return of the swallows one morning in april or may when the sites are being chosen for the new nests under the eaves it is such a sweet little chatter such a bubbling over of comment and advice and reminiscence as they get their first beakful of mud and start to lay the foundation stone of the nest what do they say i often wonder they seem to talk the whole time and explain to each other the excellent residential qualities of their various positions one thing i am sure they say and they twitter it over and over again i know they mean it though i don't understand their language for the homing instinct is strong in them as it is in all of nature's children and as i listen to them in the early morning i can almost hear their words isn't it good to be here again end of section three section four of flower patch among the hills this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Flower Patch Among the Hills by Flora Clickman At the Sign of the Rosemary Bush When the cottage was originally built, about 130 years ago, it was probably just two rooms upstairs, one going out of the other, and a kitchen and scullery downstairs. In the intervening years, however, one owner has added on a couple of rooms on one side, and another has put on two more and a pantry round the corner, and so on, till it is difficult to say exactly what type of dwelling it really is. There is a proper front door somewhere about the place, only no one ever seems to find it. The path leading to it from the main gate unobtrusively hides itself among the fir trees, wandering round at the rear of the house and under some low apple trees. Of course, no one who wasn't familiar with the geography of the estate would think of exploring such an out-of-the-way, narrow, grass-grown trail. No, they would naturally follow along the irregularly flagged broad path that is kept by the handyman fairly free from weeds, except some little ferns that will peep up at the edge, no matter what he does to them, and a saucy white violet that has planted itself in the very middle of the walk and blooms vigorously. Along this path most people go, whether they carry their best sunshade, a bead bag and a silver card case, or are merely delivering two half pounds of butter done up in dock leaves, and a cream-coloured duck wrapped up in a coarse white tea-cloth, with his liver tucked under his wing, a big bunch of fresh sage stuck in his mouth. And please, mother's put in a couple of onions, in case you didn't happen to have some. This broad path leads to a corner in the architectural conglomeration, where there are two doors at right angles, one moderately respectable, and one smaller and shabbier. If you carry a silver card case, you knock at the respectable-looking door, which promptly admits you into the scullery. If you are merely someone anxious to dispose of a few eggs, or wanting to borrow a little flour, you knock more humbly at the shabby door, to find you are battering at the coal-house. Abigail deals with callers according to their status. The silver card cases are invited, in dulcet tones, to retrace their steps along the broad path, and take the narrow one to the front door. Sometimes they do exactly as they are told, but more often, alas, they espy yet another door, which they promptly make for, and this one precipitates them right into the living room, and on top of me, no matter what I may be doing. Inside the cottage it is a similar jumble. You think you have found the living room all right, when you come in from the garden, only to pull up in a large pantry, like a small room, with shelves full of delicious mysteries in glass jars and jam pots and pickle bottles you open a door in the living room thinking it is the one leading out into the back hall to find yourself confronted with a very steep and narrow stone staircase which is one way of getting upstairs of course you get used to it all in a few days and eventually cease to tumble down over the odd step that is obligingly placed here and there in dark spots wherever the floor level changes in the halls or landings but to those who are not native born it is a wee bit confusing at first the living room was originally the kitchen it has a large fireplace with an oven and wide hobs whereon you can stand a kettle or anything else you want to keep hot it has a crane too only we don't cook our dinner in a pot suspended from it because i don't want abigail to give notice we have therefore to content ourselves with giving the crane an occasional swing. The mantelpiece, of oak that is black with age, has two shelves, the upper one projecting beyond the lower, which has a frill of chintz beneath. Higher up still, there is an ancient rack for holding a couple of guns, and there are cupboards on each side, also of black oak, that must have been put there when the house was built but I think the thing that delights my heart above everything else in this room is the huge dresser. When you start with a room like this, I forgot to mention that there are oak rafters with hooks for home-fed hams, it is easy to make it cosy. The big wooden settle keeps off draughts. Some chairs that belonged to my great-grandparents are far more comfortable than anything I could buy nowadays, 
and the wood worn to that smooth polish that can only be attained by generations of handling the oak dower chest is heavily carved though its iron hinges and locks suggest a prison door for solidity and size still it is a handy receptacle for the miscellaneous collection of manuscripts and papers that haunts me wherever i go i do not expect everybody to admire this style of room there was one caller who came out of sheer curiosity who after gazing around the living room with manifest disapproval at last said you really could make this into quite a nice little drawing-room if you had those old rafters and beams done away with and a proper ceiling put then you could easily have a nice tiled modern stove in place of that dreadfully old-fashioned fireplace with those great hobs and if you moved the dresser into the kitchen and so she went on winding up with the encouraging assurance and you would hardly know the place when you had got it all done with one voice we said we could quite believe it people so often fail to realize that both a country cottage decked out in imitation of a town villa and a town villa decked out in imitation of a country cottage are equally unsatisfying in each case the fake and insincerity of the schemes jar if it isn't bothering you too much i should like to look at the ornaments these as much as anything else give the room its unlikeness to anything you see in the city here is a lovely fat fish in a glass case among reeds and grasses on the walls are antlers of the fallow deer then there is a framed sampler and likewise some wonderful needlework of a bygone age when needlework was an art on the mantelpiece shelves are china cottages and castles an old china mill with a wonderful mill stream on which are china ducks each the size of the mill wheel then red riding hood in a little sprigged pinafore carrying a dear little basket and patting affectionately a most engaging friendly-looking wolf is always admired timothy's grandmother a dignified-looking matron teaching little timothy out of the bible is a relic from the days when scriptural subjects were among the ornaments found in most households going to market and returning from market are a choice pair of china subjects showing the lady riding behind her husband on a prancing steed that would do credit to rotten row mary and her little lamb is one of the prettiest in the collection only she lost one of her arms over fifty years ago there are various cows and sheeps some with blue ribbons round the neck and other quaint china oddities then there is a beautiful hen sitting on a most symmetrically woven china straw nest packed full of eggs each one in proportion to the hen is the size of an ostrich egg the hen eggs and all can be lifted up using her head poor thing as the handle and then you find she is the cover to an oval dish i always intend should any members of our royal family get stranded on these hills and drop in unexpectedly to tea to serve them with a poached egg in this identical dish and you must not overlook the shining brass candlesticks some tall and stately some squat with square trays and extinguishers that have been winking and glinting in the light for a century now and are still shining nor the brass and horn lantern hanging from a beam a lantern is an absolute necessity on these rugged hills when there is no moon how friendly the old brass things are just look at the warming pan with its bright sun face i have no doubt modern radiators and hot water pipes are a boon to those who do not mind headaches and dried up air but do they look as warm and comforting as the gleaming warming pan that reminds me of the first time abigail came down from london she looked at the warming pan with interest as she had never seen one before the weather was cold and hot water bottles were the order of the night in town when i returned from an evening stroll with some guests she met me with an anxious face if you please miss will you kindly show me how you keep the water inside that warming pan i can't get it to stay inside nohow when i start to lift it i wonder if you have ever seen a dresser like this one the oak shelves forming the upper part 
are built into a deep recess in the wall one above the other up to the rafters and all set back in the thickness of the wall and you can see how thick these walls are from the window ledge which is fifteen inches deep but they need to be solid for the winter storms that thrash across these hills show scant consideration for present-day building methods and a modern bijou bungalow will probably be found scattered about the next parish if it ever lived long enough to get its roof on the dresser is closely hung with jugs and mugs and cups willow pattern plates and dishes make a good deal of white and blue against the walls which are a full buttercup yellow while a collection of ancient china teapots with some square willow pattern vegetable dishes and a tall stilton cheese dish with two big sunflowers on it occupy the wider ledge at the bottom here are some uncommon specimens of luster jugs this is a rare luster mug brown with green bars outside and a purple band inside a luster pepper box stands on one of the dresser ledges and salt cellars of glass so heavy as to suggest paperweights do you know the fascination of old english mugs on this dresser they range from a tiny mug in rockingham ware only an inch and a half high to noble things that suggest long draughts of home-made herb beer there are mugs with bunches of flowers on them others with conventional bands or designs some with landscapes some with butterflies some with words of wisdom to be imbibed by the youthful along with the milk jugs again are most alluring once you get a mania for them one of my jugs is of brown earthenware smothered with a raised design showing a trailing grapevine with big bunches of grapes here and there two other jugs that belonged to a bygone ancestress are apparently made of a white stone wall with the most natural looking ivy creeping up it and displaying bunches of berries jug makers of the past gave so much interest to their goods by reason of this raised work instead of being content to transfer a flat design as they do now one white jug has off-standing deer around it grazing among trees another has a hunt in full progress horses and risers dogs and all though it always hurts me to see the running hare a real proper dresser is a useful bit of furniture provided it has plenty of hooks it holds such a quantity of things i have all sorts of odd cups and saucers on mine relics of past treasures that have somehow survived the hand of the hired washer-up little bits that remind me of all sorts of pleasant things such as tea services my mother had when i was little some that have belonged to other relatives in passing i may say that a dresser of this sort is a great incentive to good works many a relation on looking at it has said i have an old jug that belonged to your great no your great great aunt i shall give it to you as you like things of that sort or another time it will be what a collection of odd cups good gracious if a little thing like that amuses you i'll turn out a lot i have stored away somewhere glad to get rid of them it only annoys me to look at them as it reminds me how all the rest of the set got smashed you can have them and welcome there has been a good deal of this sort of give and take about the furnishing of this cottage and it is so much more interesting to me as the owner to know the history of the various items than if i have merely bought antiques by the houseful as i have known some people do in the latter case a room is so apt to look like nothing but an old curiosity shop as it is the things all seem to belong just as much as we do but i mustn't weary you with the catalogue of household furnishings though i know if you could actually see the china and the little bedrooms with white washable handwork everywhere and wonderful old patchwork and knitted quilts you would love it all the bird room is the general favourite with its unique crochet there are swallows flying across the curtain tops swans sailing among bulrushes on the washstand splash wild geese flying above the tree tops at another window ducks swimming sedately along towel ends more swallows in cross stitch this time on a table cover parrots in darned fillet on the dressing table cloth while seagulls float along the frieze a glass case of rare birds is over the mantelpiece 
and a large woolwork pheasant balancing itself ingeniously on the top of a small basket of grapes and endeavouring to look as though it were quite its natural habitat is framed and hangs on the wall i don't think the far-back relative who worked it had much of an eye for proportion however on the mantelpiece stands a sedate row of china fowls a marble fountain basin in the centre with white pigeons basking around the edge just one other room you must look into the sitting-room because i want you to see my doll's things yes i know it sounds imbecile but i never had a doll's house when i was young the rest of us were brothers and it wasn't considered economical therefore to present a toy that would only be serviceable to one out of the bunch besides which in those days children didn't immediately get what they stamped for so i had to go without the thing i yearned for above all others but you may be sure i took care of what dolls things did chance to come my way dolls themselves were very scarce but i had several sets of dolls tea things given by discerning aunts and here they are in a funny old glass cupboard in the corner of the sitting-room one is a very small set with teeny pink rosebuds on it another is a larger set that my small friends drank tea out of and occasionally smashed a cup for me there are two dinner services one in plain white a round soup tureen a gravy boat a square vegetable dish with some remaining plates and dishes the other a gorgeous affair with dickens scenes on each plate one dozen meat and six soup plates with dishes and tureens galore and oh such lovely china soup and sauce labels all on sweet these dolls things seem to affect people in different ways some look at them with eyes that go back to their own childhood and memories that recall similar treasures that they wanted when they too were little and did or did not get such people know exactly why i value these things they handle them lovingly but don't say much but then there are others who gaze at the doll's china and the little wooden animals and the glass slipper i was certain cinderella wore and the china grand piano and the doll's brass fender and all the other oddments and then look at me in blank astonishment it is evidently incomprehensible to them that any sane woman in these days of strenuous intellectuality can hoard such childish rubbish and i am powerless to explain my reasons occasionally however light breaks across one of these amazed countenances and a woman will suddenly exclaim i have part of a doll's dinner service somewhere in the attic at home i believe i shall get it out and put it in my china cabinet it looks quite smart doesn't it to which i reply yes and i hear they are going to be much worn this season all the decorations in the house are on the most homely lines one room has each deep window ledge filled with seashells and coral if you want silver boxes and cut glass scent bottles in the bedroom you must bring them yourself for we think the wooden dressing table looks all that can be desired clothed in a blue glazed lining petticoat with white dotted muslin on top and who would want a silver-backed hand glass when they have the chance of using one that has its back encrusted with small seashells there are plenty of pictures all over the house many of them without frames haulage is an expensive matter on these hills and we always take this into consideration several of the rooms have friezes made of brown paper to which have been affixed a series of coloured plates the charm of this arrangement is that you can take down the old frieze and put up a new one or stick a fresh picture over some old one as often as you please all pictures however show beautiful views of outdoor scenery heather-clad hills flowering gardens snow-covered peaks and rolling waves whether they are original paintings that famous artists have given me or plates from art magazines they are all views of large spaces and induce big restful thoughts some cards that hang on the bedroom walls have been singled out again and again by my friends for special commendation i happened to see them one day when i was going round the book salon of the r t s in st paul's churchyard one special favourite has these lines on it possibly you know them 
Good night. Sleep sweet within this quiet room, O thou who e'er thou art, And let no mournful yesterday Disturb thy peaceful heart, Nor let to-morrow scare thy rest With dreams of coming ill. Thy maker is thy changeless friend, His love surrounds thee still. Forget thyself and all the world, Put out each feverish light, The stars are watching overhead, Sleep sweet, good night, good night. Another, bought the same day, is entitled, A Quiet Resting Place. And so I find it well to come for deeper rest to this still room, for here the habit of the soul feels less the outer world's control, and from the silence multiplied by these still forms on every side, the world that time and sense has known falls off and leaves us God alone. For the flower room, Canon Langbridge's delightful book, Restful Thoughts for Dusty Ways, supplied me with a verse. Heaven covers all. When the world's weight is on my mind, and all its black-winged fears affright, think how the daisy draws her blind and sleeps without a light. And for the bird room, I have on the wall W. C. Bryant's beautiful poem, Lines to a Waterfowl. You will remember these verses. There is a power whose care teaches thy way along that pathless coast, the desert and illimitable air, lone wandering but not lost. He who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight, in the long way that I must tread alone, will lead my steps aright. On more than one occasion visitors have thanked me for having left them these good-night thoughts. Of course, being a cottage in the midst of a flower-patch, we never run short of flowers, and you will find plenty indoors. When they are in bloom, however, I always like to put a bunch of white moss rosebuds, one of my favourite flowers, in a blue mug on a visitor's dressing-table. But whatever the flowers, it is our custom to welcome all guests with rosemary, for I have discovered that the scent of it, even the sight of it, is a certain cure for the diverse maladies caused by overdoses of unsatisfactory dressmakers, cooks who give notice every month, much boredom in crowded, unventilated drawing-rooms, and all the many varieties of restlessness that have been invented to help women to kill time. It has also been known to prove efficacious in cases of people prone to overwork. At any rate, if you come to visit me, you will find a vase with sprigs of rosemary on the deep window-ledge in your room, and few of my friends go away without taking a slip from the gnarled bush by the door to plant in less congenial surroundings. I believe Shakespeare said that rosemary typifies remembrance. Virginia unblushingly improves on Shakespeare by insisting that it means the remembrance of peace. End of section 4section five of flower patch among the hills this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. flower patch among the hills by flora clickman miss quirker incidentally every visit to the cottage seems prefaced with a scramble either the work at the office suddenly does itself up in a tangle or the domestic arrangements show signs of incipient paralysis, which it takes all my available energy to avert, or else it is people who inflict themselves upon me when I'm at my final gasp without a moment, or a single company smile to spare for anybody. And of all the three forms of irritation, the uninvited people are the worst, for they always seem to absorb the last bit of vitality left me, which I had hoped would just carry me over the journey. There is Miss Quirker, for instance. You don't know Miss Quirker? How I envy you. I can best describe her as a lady well over forty, or more, who apparently hasn't anything at all to do, and who does it thoroughly well. She has a couple of very decided and conspicuous gifts. One is the ability to waste the time and dissipate the amiable qualities of every individual whose path she crosses and the other is a positive genius for saying the wrong thing. I was near the window writing for all I was worth, 
when she knocked at the door and inquired for me, adding, "'I see she is busy writing, but if you tell her who it is, I know she'll see me.' Of course, I had to see her. She entered the room with a kittenish little rush and scuffle, that is by no means the happiest form of affectation for a tall, largely built woman, well over forty or more. "'Ah, I found you in at last.' with a roguish wag of a stiff finger in a size too small glove. I was determined to see you, dear, although Abigail always looks so forbidding at the door. I met Miss Virginia shopping just now, and I asked if you were at home. She said you were frightfully busy, nearly off your head with work, as you were leaving town the first thing in the morning. So I said at once, then of course I must go round and call on her this very afternoon. She said she wasn't sure that you'd be in if I did, but I said I should chance it. It's such an age since we've met. Why, not since your engagement was announced. Now, just give me an account of yourself and tell me all about everything. I would have asked Miss Virginia, but I never think she is all cordial, or perhaps, I should say, sympathetic. Indeed, I don't think she really knew me at first. I was right in her path, yet she seemed to look through me but I took a seat next to her at the lace counter and spoke to her. By the way, is she deaf? It was so strange that she didn't seem to hear a quarter of the questions I asked her about you, so I really got next to no information from her. It was so funny sometimes that I almost laughed. I've such a sense of humour, you know. For instance, when I asked her what she thought of your fiancé, you know you've never introduced me to him yet. And was it her idea of a suitable match, and was he tall or short? she replied. I think it wonderful value considering, and it should wear well. The size is five yards round, so I had better have six yards to allow for corners. Do you know, I was some minutes before I realised that she wasn't talking about his waist measure, but an afternoon tea cloth for which she was buying the lace. She evidently hadn't heard a word I had said, and so I raised my voice and asked her what part he had come from, as I knew he didn't go to our church. She just looked at me and replied, Clooney, I always think Clooney lace washes so well, don't you? You see, I got absolutely nothing out of her. In fact, I wondered, dear, whether, of course, I know you don't mind me speaking quite frankly, whether there had been a little rift, uh, you understand. Of course, I know you've a wonderful fund of patience. Only those two girls always seem to be with you, and though I'm sure you wouldn't tell them so, yet any one with the very slightest tact might see that they aren't wanted, and of course... Oh, well, I'm glad to hear you do think as much of them as ever. I shouldn't have thought it, but you needn't mind telling me if there had been a little coolness. I'm fairly sharp at seeing through a stone wall, and I always have said that, personally, mind you. I never knew two girls less. Of course, we won't discuss them if you'd rather not. As you know, I am the very last one to want to introduce a disagreeable topic. We'll talk about you. Turn round to the light and let me see how you are looking. "'My dear, but you do look ill. "'I don't know when I've seen you looking so utterly washed out and anemic. "'You never felt better in your life? "'Well, I'm glad to hear it, I'm sure. "'Oh, I see what it is. "'It's that blue dress you are wearing that gives you that aged and sallow look. "'A very trying colour, isn't it? "'I don't think anyone ought to wear that colour, "'but those with very clear, young-looking complexions. "'And then it looks charming.' It always suited me. By the way, did Madame Delphine make that dress? I thought so. I knew it the minute I saw you. It's a queer thing. But I have never yet seen anyone look even passable in a dress that she has made. You can't exactly say that it doesn't fit, can you? It's a something, I don't know how to express it, about her gowns that always strikes me as, well, you know what I mean, don't you? And that dress you've got on looks just like that. I know you won't mind me speaking quite plainly. You see, I've known you for so long, and I'm not one to flatter. I never was. What we need in this world is absolute sincerity. Don't you agree with me? And I always think it's the kindest thing when you see a friend in anything that makes her look plainer than ever, to tell her so at once. Then she knows just exactly what she looks like. And after all, other people are the best judges as to what suits us. We can't see ourselves. Mrs. Ridley was saying at the Guild at home, at the Archdeacon's the other day, she thought you were so wise to stick to that way you do your hair. She said she thought it suited you, considering that— Here I did manage to interpolate a sarcastic regret that they couldn't find a more interesting topic of conversation. 
oh yes we had other more interesting things to talk about dear but mrs archdeacon had your photo on the table and the archdeacon said something about you i forget what nothing of any importance and that was the only reason we mentioned you i said i thought perhaps you did it that way because it was a little thin just there oh i know you used to have a lot of hair dear but some people's hair does come out and a pad doesn't look so well anywhere else it's all your own hair you don't wear well i am surprised i should never have thought it i don't mean that it looks much in any case but i always concluded that you wore oh how delightful i'll confess i was longing for a cup of tea yes three lumps and plenty of milk i always say it makes up for any deficiencies in the tea if one has lots of milk china tea is it i thought so i dare say it's all right for those who like it and of course if you tell people what it is they understand why it looks so poor on no account don't think of having some indian tea made specially for me i can quite well make do because i'm going straight home after i leave you and tea will be waiting for me and i shall have a good cup first thing yes i think i will have another sandwich even though it is the third time of asking these make me think of the guild at home last week you ought to have been there the archdeacon makes such a delightful host and the sandwiches well i can't tell you what they were like literally hundreds and hundreds of them and such delicious filling all cut in their own kitchen too you really should get mrs archdeacon to tell you what her cook put in them you'd never touch one of these ordinary ones again once you had tasted hers but what i would like to know is what does she do with all the crusts mrs ridley thought that perhaps they made them into savoury puddings only as i said to her how about those with fish in them she said that perhaps they kept them separate when cutting but i know the shuffling ways of cooks better than that i never kept one and never will i must certainly try the cake if you made it yourself i seldom get time to do any cooking myself though i'm a very good hand at cakes but you've secretaries to take everything off your hands you must have lots of spare time a moment's pause while she tries the cake have you ever used the busy bee flour sifter no then i should strongly advise you to get one i should think that might help you make a lighter cake or do you think you put in enough baking powder but there some people have a light hand with cakes and some haven't i don't think anything makes any difference if you haven't it's just like plants isn't it they'll always grow well for those who love them your ferns aren't looking very bright are they oh don't you like the ends of the fronds rubbed i see they were given you by your fiance, and naturally they are the apple of your eye that reminds me you haven't shown me his portrait yet i'm longing to see it is that the gentleman well he's the very last man in the world i should have chosen for you not a bit like what i pictured no i don't mean that there's anything wrong with him only um he doesn't look a scrap like the man you would become engaged to well i don't know what i can exactly describe the type of man i expected i thought he would be tall and he is over six feet well he doesn't look it from his photo does he that's true a vignetted head doesn't show the full height but apart from that i expected an artistic sort of man he is really and then i should have pictured him rather a uh, well napoleonic and with that far away poetic fire in his eyes that carries you off your feet to untold heights no of course i don't mean an aviator i mean a uh, but it isn't easy to put into words only you can't think how disab how surprised i am to see a little man of course i remember you did say he was tall and well made but there handsome is as handsome does and after all i've heard that it is often the plainest and most uninteresting looking men that turn out the best in the end i can only hope that it will be so in your why i declare here's miss virginia how do you do we've been talking about you all the afternoon well i really must be going and i simply won't listen to any of your persuasions to stay longer i brightened her up nicely miss virginia she was looking ever so gloomy when i called good-bye dear good-bye miss virginia exit miss quirker what we said after she had gone had better not be recorded my own remarks may not have been quite cordial but i know that virginia's were even worse if that were possible but though visitations such as these when bestowed upon me at the eleventh hour always reduced me mentally to a sort of bran mash 
and virginia says she can't see why anybody need bother a government to import pulp nowadays considering the state of her brain to say nothing of those of other people who shall be nameless the sight of the garden makes me human once more and by sunset the silence of the hills has so restored my soul that the sun seldom if ever goes down upon my wrath after tea there will probably be two hours of daylight for watering the garden even though the sun has dropped behind the opposite hills it is light up here on the hilltop long after the valley has gone to sleep and when the sun has really set there is a long and lovely twilight indoors and out there is absolute peace the grandfather's clock ticks with that slow deliberation that is so soothing even the preliminary rumble it gives before striking is never irritating you feel it is a concession due to advanced age through the open window float the scents of thousands of flowers that are feeling unspeakably grateful for the liberal watering the girls have been giving them you cannot distinguish any one in particular one moment you think it is the sweetbriar then you are sure it is the white lilies then the breeze brings the breath of the honeysuckles that are climbing trees and hedges till the whole air is laden with perfume up the garden white dresses are seen among the borders there i believe we've done everything but that upper bed of hollyhocks and they won't hurt for to-night virginia sounds as though she has been working hard now the tent calls out ursula and we all make a stampede to the bottom of the lower orchard and with a few dexterous turns the tent is turned and folded up for though the trees may be motionless now the wind springs up at any moment on these hills and once you hear it soughing in the tops of the big fir trees in the garden you will realize the advantage of having the tent indoors as you saunter up the garden back to the house crushing the sweet-coloured black peppermint in the grass underfoot the stars seem very near the cottage looks like a toy with the light shining from each little window and as you cross the threshold into the living room the log fire flashes and gleams a fire is acceptable up here after sundown even in the summer and everything smiles with such a cosy welcome till brass candlesticks and cups and jugs and the homely willow patterns on the dresser all seem to say we are so glad you've come End of section 5